Good morning, folks. This is Todd Colburn of Cal Poly Pomona with your Aerospace Structures series. This video is on beams, specifically calculating the slope and deflection and the elastic curve. Let's take a look at how it works. So here's a couple pictures of uh, sketches of cantilever, a uh, couple beams. One is a cantilever beam, one is a propped beam. We see the beam as it deflects under load, and we see a little line where the elastic surface, or the uh, where the uh, neutral axis of the beam is. When we're evaluating the beam, uh, the slope and deflection of beams, we're going to focus on that neutral axis where the where the uh, stresses are zero, and we can kind of pretend that that beam, no matter how deep it is, is kind of shrunk down to just a line of height so that we've got one value that characterizes the deflection and the slope. That shape of the deflection and slope is called the elastic curve, and it is one of the keys to evaluating the response of beams, specifically when we need deflection and slope. So we're going to be looking for two key relations to define the elastic curve. The slope as a function of the of x, the x position of the beam moving from left to right, that's theta x, theta of x, and the deflection of the beam as a function of x as we move from left to right, that's going to be called y of x. And in some of the examples we pull out of Hibbler, we'll see it's called v of x, no big deal. Okay. Now, if we drop back to a couple lectures ago when we we're deriving our stress equations for beams, we started by examining a straight beam that I bent before your very eyes into this curved shape. And when we did that, we evaluated the strain at any position y above the neutral axis, where the strain was just the deflection over that original length. We took a closer look at the deformation to, to compare that deformation from the radius, uh, the center of the radius of curvature. And we compared the little triangle of strain distribution above the neutral axis versus the position of the beam from that center of curvature. We wrote this relation that the deflection of the beam is related to the y position, or excuse me, the uh, axial deflection of any point along the cross section is related to the deflection of the beam as that uh, original length of that element in the beam is relative to that radius of curvature. We can rewrite it this way. We also noted that our strain then is the def uh, that y position divided by the radius of curvature. And we saw that for a force on any elemental strip, that the force is just the stress times the area. So far, so good. We noted that the moment was just that force times its y position for that little element. And the total moment would then be the sum of those. We saw that for moments in the elastic range, we can apply Hooke's Law, which states that stress is equal to EE, right? The modulus times the strain. And we combined our strain relation, stress equals EY over R. We then inserted that and came up with this relation. We noted that part of that was the moment of inertia and developed this relation for as the moment res with respect to I is equal to the E with respect to the radius of curvature. And we use that to derive our stress equations. But what we're going to do today is we're going to drop back to this relation M over I equals E over R, where R is the radius of curvature. And we're going to focus on this relation to develop our equations for slope and deflection. So if we continue our derivation, we're starting with this relation we just talked about. We know that 1 over R is just M over EI. We can just rearrange that in that manner. And then if we take a look at this, we see that from the radius of curve, from the center of the radius of curvature, we evaluate the ds position as a function of that d theta and r. And we know that for small angles, we can write that ds, the little arc length that we traverse on the outer edge, is equal to r d theta. 
which we can rearrange to write 1 over r equals d theta ds. So combining with our earlier relation, after we note that when our beam is initially straight and our d theta is very, very small, when in which case dx equals ds, we can write 1 over r is about equal to d theta dx. This means 1 over the radius of curvature is equal to the change in the slope with respect to position. So for every little increment of distance along the beam we travel, we can use this to determine how much the slope is going to change of the beam. Okay. Therefore, we can uh, combine this with our earlier relation to find that d theta dx equals m over ei. Now, if we take a closer look at the axis of the beam, as we see in this little figure here, and we see that actually tangent of theta is equal to dy, the change in deflection, over dx, the change in length along the beam. And then if we have small angles again, our tangent of theta is equal to theta, so that our theta can be written as dy dx approximately. And now we can combine these relations say, okay, 1 over the radius of curvature is the change in slope with respect to x, which is the change in the change in deflection, right, since theta equals dy dx with respect to x. So what we see is m over ei is equal to the second derivative of the deflection. This is what the farmer was singing about, ei, ei, o. Oh, he was trying to be an engineer and he just blew it and ended up planting some crops anyways, or milking some pigs, or I don't know what. So the second, but this is, don't get distracted here. This is really important. The second derivative of the deflection is equal to the moment over EI. What this means is if we have an equation for the deflection of the beam, and we differentiate that twice, we will get the equation for the moment of the beam with respect to X, over EI. This is very powerful and we can use calculus to solve this either direction. Since M is actually M of X, we can write two key relations. The first one is that the change in slope with respect to X is equal to the moment of X over EI. The second one is the second derivative of the deflection is equal to moment over EI. This says if we have the moment, it's equal to the second derivative of the deflection and the first derivative of the slope, which means it is the, uh, we can take moment, the moment, while well, we can take the deflection and differentiate down to the moment and beyond, we can also take the moment equation, which is the easier thing to determine, and integrate up to the slope and then deflection of the beam. This is extremely powerful, and we're going to be studying this for the rest of this lecture. So if we drop back to our elastic curve, the key relations, and we just take a look at a typical beam focused on that neutral surface, we have this relation that the second derivative of the deflection is equal to 1 over EI times the moment equation for the beam. Now, what this means is going back to our lecture on shear and moment relations, we saw that we actually had to have another, uh, a different function for M for different segments of the beam when we use continuous calculus. But this is even more powerful when we say, wait a minute, we can use singularity functions that had one equation for the entire beam. And now we can just focus on that and differentiate it to solve this beam. So we have the second derivative of the deflection is equal to 1 over EI of M of X. And we also have the change in theta with respect to X equals equal to 1 over EI M of X. If we just focus on this little segment of beam A to Q, then it looks like this. We can see both the deflection and the slope shown in that little blow up picture. Okay. So these express the behavior of the elastic curve because it tells us about its position, Y, and its orientation theta.
these equations are both functions of m of x, and so we can actually integrate m of x to get the slope and then the deflection of the beam. So we're going to have the first thing we're going to do is we're going to take, we can take the uh, moment, we integrate it once. When we do that, we have a constant of integration that springs out. Now we saw when we were looking at moment and shear relations that we could ignore that constant of integration mainly because when we insert our boundary conditions it always goes to zero when we move from the, the load to the shear from the shear to the moment if you don't remember that review those lectures but now we can no longer ignore it it will sometimes be zero and other times it won't be so we need to make sure when we do our integration we pop that constant of integration out we're gonna have to plug in our boundary conditions to solve the beam now you may have some really horrifying, you may have a little uh, post-traumatic stress disorder from when you took calculus and you found out that you did that until you hated calculus. But actually, it actually is quite simple for these kinds of beams. It's completely doable way back to when you actually liked calculus. So don't wig out on us. Stick with us. You can do this. We can then integrate that puppy again we can integrate the slope to get the deflection, or what we're doing is taking actually the second integral of the moment. We now find our C1 goes to C1x, and we get another constant integration popping out. If we recall that our shear is equal to the change in moment with respect to x, and our uh, load is the change in shear with respect to x, then we can write that the third derivative of the deflection is simply the shear over EI, and the fourth derivative of the deflection is simply the loading over EI. Now, one warning to the wise or to those who uh, are using other texts, a lot of texts, Beer and Johnson, for instance, defined a positive load downward, and therefore they have a negative sign in a bunch of these equations. But in uh, the Aerospace Stress Handbook, I define a positive load upward such that we don't have that that negative sign coming out of nowhere when we use these functions okay you need to recall how to use the constraints whenever we have a pin we're fixing uh, our two deflections will be zero roller one deflection will be zero fixed will have a deflection and a slope equal to zero free has no constraints and a hinge means our moment is zero. You're going to need to remember these boundary conditions because we're going to need to take advantage of these when we go on and we start trying to solve for our constants, our uh, constant of integration C1 and C2. Okay? So let's, uh, that's basically everything we need to cover here. Let's take a systematic analysis approach. Our first step will be to write our loading function. The best way to do that is singularity functions. Go back to lecture 12. I believe it's 12C, where we cover singularity functions. Write your loading function, one function for the entire beam. Then we integrate that puppy to get the shear. Our constant of integration is zero, so we can ignore that. We integrate that puppy again, and that gives us the moment. Once again, our co coefficient, uh, our constant of integration is zero. Oh, I like to call these C sub V, C sub M. They find it's easier than C1, C2 to show that the CV came into play when we had integrated for shear. The CM came into play when we integrated for moment. The C theta came into play when we integrated for slope. And we're going to see that the CY comes into play when we integrate for deflection. So we integrated that moment for the slope. And then we integrate one more time to get the deflection. Okay. Oh, uh, and what this says here is now we can continue on and carry this constant integration forward, but actually it's good practice to first look before we integrate for the, uh, for the deflection. A lot of us, uh, when we have too big of algebraic equations, we tend to drop back into the 11th grade or whenever, and we start making mistakes. So if we can turn that constant of integration into an actual number, a lot of times it's easier for us. So take a look at your beam and see if there's a slope constraint, because if there is, you can plug it in now 
and probably solve for that constant of integration before we integrate again. If not, no problem, we'll just carry it forward as a variable. Okay? Then we integrate again for the deflection of the beam, and, and once again we plug in our boundary conditions. If we already plugged in a boundary condition at the last step, then we just need to plug in one more. If we didn't, if there were no slope constraints, like if we have a pin-pin beam, then now we'll just plug in two uh, deflection constraints, one after the other, and then solve for our unknowns. Okay? And we already said this. Got that? And here are some boundary constraints uh, just being shown off to the right. That's from Hibbler, that chart. Okay? So once again, to sum our, our relations, we have V of X equals the integral of the load function. Moment is the integral of the shear function. Slope is the integral of the moment function divided by EI. The Y is the integral of the slope function. Remember, that already has the EI in it. Okay? That means another way to write this is we can write all of them as integrals of the loading diagram. The shear is the first integral of the loading function. The moment is the second integral of it. The slope is the third integral of it. And the deflection is the fourth integral. So one way is looking at each one is an integral of the prior one. And the other one is a first, second, third, and fourth integral of the same function. Okay? Either way you want to look at that. And don't forget, this is that beautiful relation that the fourth derivative of the slope of the deflection is equal to 1 over EI times the loading. These are very powerful equations. So, this is a very important lecture. And in it, we learned about the elastic curve, which is the deflection and slope of that neutral surface of the beam. We learned that we can take the loading function which we previously knew how to integrate into shear and moment, that we could take that moment relation and integrate that twice more. Once divided by EI to get the slope, and another time divided by EI to get the deflection. This is very powerful, and we're going to find out next time that it's no harder when we have indeterminate beams. We just have a little more algebra. You're going to want to make sure that you solve your homework carefully, or if you're an industry professional or you're in another school, pull up your uh, hand. Your, uh, you can try solving these examples on your own without looking. Just write down the problem and solve it. Or you can pull up a Beer and Johnson or a Hibbler or a Miriam and Crage. These all have numerous examples that you can follow through and other problems you can work through with answers in the back of the book to practice until you have this nailed. Now this is not something we do a lot in industry. Usually an in industry will simplify into a nice canned function or we'll write a final model, but it's a classical skill that you should be able to do and you're expected to be able to do in nearly every undergraduate engineering program in mechanical, aerospace, and civil engineering. So get some practice. Enjoy.